on, on English sex and French sex. It doesn't. Take me to Marina Green. Exactly as you'd expect, and it was still a lot of fun to see a neuron to generate images like it did. And with Clip, it was an exploration in the opposite direction, which is can a neural network learn to see using a lot of loose natural language supervision? Can it learn a huge variety of visual context, concepts, and can it do so in a way that's very robust? So that you know, and I think the robustness point is something which I think is you know, it's also very flexible, but I, I think the robustness point is especially important in my eyes. And let me explain what I mean by robustness. So, there is one thing which I think is especially notable and unsatisfying in neural network supervision is that they make these mistakes that a human being would never make. So we, sp we spoke earlier about the image net data set and about training neural networks to recognize the images in the data And you'd have neural nets which achieve superhuman performance in this data set. Then you put it on your phone and you start taking photos and it would make all these disappointing mistakes. What's going on? And then it turns out that what's really going on is that there are all kinds of peculiarities in this data set which are hard to notice if you don't pay close attention. And so people have built all kinds of test sets with the same objects, but for maybe unusual angles or in a different presentation, for which the image of neural network was just fake. But the clip neural network, it was trained on this vast and loosely labeled data from the internet of text. This neural network was able to do well on all these variants of image It was much more robust with the presentation of the visual concept. And I think this kind of robustness is very important because human beings are, when it comes to our vision, you know, a third of our brain is dedicated to vision. Our vision is unbelievably and I feel like this is a step towards making neural nets a little bit more robust, a little bit more neural nets whose capability is a little bit more in line with the capability of, of our own vision. Now, you say ImageNet versus the clip data set. The clip data set is a lot larger. How much larger is it then? I mean, what's the difference in size between those? 100 times larger. I mean, it has it has open-ended categories because the categories are just deep on text. Mm -hmm. But it's really kind of the size, but also the coverage and the variety. You need the data set needs to be diverse. It needs to have a lot of stuff in. If the data set is narrow, it will hurt the neural network. When, when I look back at the last 10, well, nine-ish years, right, since um, since the ImageNet breakthrough, it seems like year after year, there are new breakthroughs, new capabilities that didn't exist before. Many of them, <laughs> thanks to you, Ilya, and, and your collaborators. And I'm kind of curious, how do you kind of, from looking back at the last nine years, and then as you project forward, are there some things that you are particularly excited about that we can't yet do to Today, but you're hopeful that you know, maybe become feasible in the next few years. Yeah, so I'd say that there, there is a sense in which the deep learning saga is actually a lot older than the past nine years. If you read some of the statements made by Rosenblatt, I think in the 60s, so the Rosenblatt invented the perceptron, which was the one of the first neural networks that could learn something interesting on a real computer, it could learn some image classification, and then the Rosenblatt went to the, onto the New York Times and he said, you know, one day a neural network will see and hear and translate and be conscious of itself and be your friend, something like this. And he was trying to raise money to build increasingly larger computers, and he had academic detractors who didn't like the way funding was misallocated in their mind, and that led mm -hmm. to, the, to the first major neural network winter. And then I think now these ideas were kind of always there in the background, just that the environment wasn't ready, because you needed both the data and the computer. And then as soon as the data and the computer became ready, you were able to jump on this opportunity and materialize the progress. And I, I fully expect that progress will continue. I think that we will have far more capable neural networks. I think that, you know, I don't want to be too specific about what I think, like, about what exactly may happen because it's hard to predict those things. But I would say one thing which would be nice if is to see our neural networks being even more reliable than they are, being so reliable that you can really trust their output and when they don't know something, they'll just tell you and maybe ask for verification. I think that would be quite impactful. I think they'll be, they will be taking a lot more action than they are right now. I think our neural networks are still quite inert and passive and they'll be much more useful. Their usefulness will continue to grow and I mean, for sure, I, I'm totally certain that we will need some kind of new ideas, even if those new ideas may have the form of looking at things differently from the way they're looking at them right now. And I would argue that a lot of the major progress in deep learning has been swamped. Well, for example, the most recent progress in supervised learning, like what, what was what was done? What, what's different? We just train larger language models, but they've existed in the past. It just we realized that language models were, were the right thing all along. So I think there will be more real 
visualizations like this, where things that are right in front of our noses are actually far more powerful and far more capable than we expected. And yeah, and I do expect that the capability of these systems will continue to increase. They will become increasingly more impactful in the world. They will become a much greater topic of conversation. I think that the product we will see unbelievable, truly unbelievable applications, incredible applications, positive, very given like transformative applications. I think you know we could we could, we could imagine lots of them with very powerful AI and eventually I really do think that we'll be in a world where the AI does the work and we the people enjoy enjoy this work and we, we, we use the work to, to our to our benefit and enjoyment. Part of the reason open AI is a cap profit company where after we return our obligations to our investors we turn back into a non-profit so that we could help materialize this future vision where you have this useful AI that's doing all the work and all the people get to enjoy it. And that's really beautiful. I, I, I like the model you have there because it essentially I mean, it reflects the in some sense the vision that the benefits of you know really capable AI could be unlimited and it's not great to concentrate an unlimited benefit into a very small group of people because I mean that's just not not great for the rest of the world. So love the model you have there. One of the things that ties into this area is that maybe AI is also becoming more expensive. A lot of people talk about it, that, you know, training models, you want a bigger model that's going to be more capable, but then, you know, you need the resources to train those bigger models. And I'm really curious about your thinking on that. You know, is, is it just going to be, you know, the more money, the bigger the model, the more capable, or is it possible that the future is different? So there is, there is a huge amount of incentive to increase the efficiency of our models and to find ways to do more with less. And this incentive is, is very strong and it affects everyone in the field. And I fully expect that in the future we'll be able to do much more using a fraction of the cost that we do right now. I think that's just going to happen for sure. I think cost of hardware will drop. I think methods will become more efficient in all sorts of ways. There are multiple dimensions of efficiency that the models will utilize that they aren't. At the same time, I also think that it is true that bigger models will always be better. And I think that's just a fact of life. And I expect there should be almost like a kind of a power law of different models doing different things. I think you'll have very powerful models that are used for certain tasks, and you'd have many more smaller models that are still hugely useful, but and then you have even more models which are smaller and more specialized. So you have this kind of continuum of size, specialization, and it's going to be an ecosystem. It's going to be not unlike how in nature there are animals that will occupy any niche. And so I expect that the same thing will happen with compute, that for every level of compute, there will be some optimal way of using it. And people will find that way and create very interesting applications. Love your vision, Elia. Um, we actually covered a tremendous <laughs> amount already. And I'm really intrigued by everything we covered. But there's one question that, that's really still on my mind that I'm hoping we can, uh, we can get through which is um, you've been behind a lot of the, the breakthroughs in AI in the last 10 years, even actually even a bit before that. I'm just kind of curious, what does your day look like? What, what, what do you think are some habits and things on your schedule or, or things you do that help you be creative and productive? It's hard to give useful blanket advice like this, but maybe two two answers consist of protecting my time and just trying really hard. You know, I don't think I don't think there is an easy way. You need to just, just gotta embrace this up and, and, and push through those walls and that's where the good steps are. Now when you say protecting your time, which which really resonates, of course, then you get to choose how you fill it in. And I'm kinda of curious if you just look at let's say maybe, you know, the last week or, or the week before and you're like protect it time what are you doing are you going on walks are you reading papers are you brainstorming with people what what's going on yeah i'd say i'd say mostly in my case it would be not necessarily going in works but lots of solitary work and yeah there are people with whom i have very intense research conversations which are very important and those are the main things i do i do know that you're also an artist or you know aspiring artist or whatever we want to call it at the same time do you think that plays a role at all in, in boosting your creativity i mean i'm sure it doesn't hurt so now it's hard hard to know with these things obviously but yeah i i think it can only help well Ilya, it's so wonderful to have had this chance to chat with you i mean it's been way too long since we've had a chance to catch up and, and this has been so good to you know get to know you even better than than before uh thank you so much for making the time thank you peter I had a great pleasure being on the podcast so this wraps up the last episode in season one of the robot brains podcast like I said in the opening of this episode, thank you for joining us on this journey. We will return for season two in October. In the meantime, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we'll be posting new video materials throughout our break. 
I look forward to having you join us again for season two very soon. Psychology professor Ann Singhouse was a first. Instead of deaf kids scattered about? podcast, a show about AI and robots and the brilliant brains who make them. Today here with me is Chris Urmson. Chris is one of the world-leading pioneers in self-driving. He led the Google self-driving project for several years. Then, in 2017, he co-founded his own self-driving company, Aurora, where he is the CEO. And actually, even before the modern commercial era of self-driving started, Chris first participated and then led the CMU team in the DARPA Autonomous Driving Challenges. Very few people on the planet have had a hand in as many advances in the field of autonomous vehicles as Chris has. So good to have you on the podcast. Welcome, Chris. Oh, thanks, Peter. Really, really enjoy the chance to be here. Thanks. Well, it's so good to have you. I remember the first time I ran across, well, not literally you, but but your name and, and your work was, uh, I was still a PhD student at the time, and I think maybe you were still a PhD student. Um, this was a DARPA Grand Challenge, where CMU had one of the top entries in the competition. Uh, were you still a PhD student at the time? So, <laughs> for the first one, yeah, I, I was. The second one, I was special faculty, I think, or something mm -hmm. like that. So, this was the big desert race that kicked off the modern era of self-driving. I'm really curious, as a PhD student, I remember back, back when I was a student at Stanford, Sebastian Thrun led the, led the Stanford team, and of course, you've worked with him a lot since. 
I remember it was a, a long like discussion in the beginning, like, you know, should he even enter this challenge? And, you know, a lot of back and forth, you know, I wonder what was what might have gone on in your side? How did you decide or, you know, were you maybe <laughs> requested to enter? I was a graduate student back then and I was working on a robot on a NASA project actually to go to deserts and kind of practice exploring for exploring science on other planets. And you know, I worked on the, the kind of combination of perception and motion planning to make this thing drive. And we were out in the desert, I think when when I first heard about this down in Chile in the Atacama Desert, which is just an amazing place and we had this robot driving there called Hyperion that was driving at about 30 centimeters a second so you know picture somebody with a walker and that's about how fast we were going and my PhD advisor Red Whitaker came down and had heard about the DARPA Grand Challenge and said we're gonna make a, a Humvee drive across the desert at 50 miles per hour it just sounded really cool right I you know I was excited about you know the idea of driving at high speeds I was excited about honestly the competition part of it seemed like it would be fun yeah it just seemed like an incredible opportunity to take some of what we had been doing and to to take you know the broad swath of knowledge that had been built up in robotics over previous decades and try and bring that and and focus it and try to get something that that could really go do this thing that many you know it's called a grand challenge because a lot of us didn't believe that it really could be done certainly not in the 12 or 18 months or whatever it was that we actually had to to put together a team and actually solve the problem now there were two desert race is followed by an urban challenge you were in it from the first desert race and when you say it wasn't clear if it could be done that first desert race it wasn't done right i mean no it, it, it was spectacular right we we had been at the time um you know i was a, a graduate student we had a team of a bunch of undergraduate engineers we'd kind of hacked together this retired military humvee um, right it had been out at some farmer's yard and he had decided he didn't want it anymore and so we bought it and retrofitted it with motors and stuff none of the fancy drive-by wire interfaces that everybody gets to play with today we had taken it out to nevada to go test out by carson city and all the old pony express trail and you know we had been out there and we could never get anywhere close to 150 miles and we figured you know to actually be able to complete the 150 mile race we were supposed to as part of the grand challenge we had to do that so uh we started to put an emphasis on duration about 10 days before the qualifying for this event we were out at this dirt test track and we set off to go and drive the 150 miles just basically in a, a giant mile and a half oval we got the first lap out and everything was going pretty well and it was doing it at 30 miles per hour I being a super intelligent graduate student did the math and said if we're doing 150 miles at 30 miles an hour that'll take five hours whereas if we do 150 miles at 50 miles per hour that'll take three hours <laughs> now we can get on to doing the other things so we should do that we sped it up to around a lap that was pretty good and then the second second lap well it got into a little bit of soft soil off the side of the road and we ended up an amazing team effort pulled the thing back together got it to to the qualification events that were down at you know a racetrack in in southern california I ended up qualifying first which was kind of shocking and then we got to race day and you know did all the preparations we were supposed to you know ran the checklists uh launched this thing and it was an incredible moment uh right that there was you know, a grandstand full of people. We get to launch this thing off into the desert. And it was kind of like, I imagine sending your, your child off to college, right? That, you know, you've been near this, this thing you've been putting your whole life into for months and, you know, in this case, a year plus. And it just goes off and drives into the desert. And it was awe-inspiring and brilliant and amazing. And, you know, you could, in our case, it was this big Humvee with an electrical box and a fin on the top. And so eventually you could just kind of see the fin over the uh -huh. the, the sagebrush out in the desert uh, and the helicopters that the military had, you know, kind of filming it. Uh, and it went off, supposed to drive 150 miles between um, Slash X Ranch in Southern California and just outside of Las Vegas from Nevada. And it got about seven and a half miles out in the desert on its way there it drove through three fence posts so we there was room to improve good that we had the big vehicles what i say because if it had been a smaller vehicle <laughs> it may not have made it and then it gets you know through a variety of reasons it ended up high centered on a berm on the side of the this this mountain pass and it was you know people anthropomorphize robots but, and in this case it was one of the saddest things because you know it got high centered and stuck and because we had the 
you know, proportional control loop, it realized it wasn't moving, uh, and so that meant it pressed the gas harder. And so the wheels on this Humvee were just spinning as fast as it, you know, the engine was revving at full speed. And, and because it was still slightly in touch, the wheels were grinding against the gravel, but not getting anywhere and melting the rubber. So there's this, basically it was literally on fire, right? And then eventually the, the defense department who were out there chasing it said, okay, it's not getting anywhere. Um, and, and so they hit the kill switch. And an interesting fact about Humvees, unlike a conventional car which has brakes out in the wheels, uh, there's actually a, a quarter shaft that comes in and then brakes. When they hit the brakes, those clamped down very quickly and just snapped the axles on the car because of all the inertia in the wheel stand. So we had this poor thing that had driven out, kind of made history that day, but it was came back basically on fire, smoking with broken legs. But it was it was an incredible day, even though we were mightily disappointed with the outcome. In some sense, it's disappointing. But the other hand, I mean, it's never been done before going in. I don't think anybody had any precise expectations on what the best team is going to achieve, right? I, I think that's spot on, right? And I think that, you know, the media obviously had fun with it, uh, right? Imagine uh, a marathon where the best runner goes two miles out into the field and then kind of collapses, right? Like, so it was kind of like that. But in there, you know, in, I think I think it was actually really impressive, the perspective the Defense Department took, DARPA took on this. And they said, you know, that day they said, this, is, this has been great, really exciting. Come back, you know, a year from now and let's try it again. Right, and they, they kind of saw the promise, they saw the energy, they saw how much this had captured the imagination of the folks that showed up. It was really, you know, it was a special event for those of us in, in robotics where we just had so many people come together and it was kind of like a conference, but very practical, which was which was kind of fun about it. And what was your sentiment at the in the moment? Were you like, yes, I want to do another one next year, I want to show them? Or were you like, I wish I can get back to my other research? Uh, it was less want to show them. Uh, that, that was never it. It was more more a sense that we weren't finished with the business, right? Like this was a thing we set out to do. In the moment, it was crushing, uh, right? This had, this had been a lot of effort and, you know, we were doing it on a shoestring budget and anytime you, you face defeat, it's challenging. But it was really, okay, we get to go do this again and, you know, and it was an incredible experience. Yeah, and so you now have the whole year to prepare for the second edition of the DARPA Grand Challenge, the Desert Race. How did that year go and, and how did that day go for you? It, it was special. So that year I got my PhD. I got a job with a temporarily with a defense contractor uh, who basically made my job working on this challenge. We came back instead of having one Humvee, we brought two. So we had redundancy. We really improved the quality of the driving of it and then entered the competition. Faithfully, Sebastian Thrun out of Stanford had entered as well. You know, it was again, it was an incredible experience uh, to, to be part of a team that was so focused, um, really just wanted to make this work. You know, we were able to enter the competition. Our teams qualified first and third with the, the team from Stanford qualifying in the middle between us. We ended up, because we had two vehicles, we picked two different strategies. We set one to go a bit faster and, and one to go uh, a little bit slower and be a little more cautious. The one that we set to go faster was Highlander, our, our, our newest vehicle. And it, we unfortunately had rolled it about 10 days before the competition again. This time having actually out on a real course, having run, you know, tens of miles. And it was an amazing day to see the vehicle set up off into the field, it felt much more like you had higher confidence that they were going to, to, to be success, right? They just, the vehicle seemed more capable, more competent. It was amazing. And watching throughout the day as the different vehicles, you know, would come by the, the points because this time, instead of it being kind of from one point to another, they kind of wrapped the course around the area where the, where the start was. And so you could see vehicles at different points in the day. And they had this map where they had the trackers of the vehicles projected on it. So you could see them. It was, it was really something special. And then partway through the day, the, our vehicle Highlander, the one that we had said to go fastest, ran into a problem. It was related. We, we, we ultimately, maybe a decade later, kind of found what we think was the problem was a, a component that had been damaged in the rollover that we didn't replace, just cut power, caused there to be a power loss in the vehicle. And so this poor thing, this Humvee that can drive over incredible things was on this 
incredibly gentle slope rolling backwards uh, because the power browned out on the vehicle. It turned out we lost the primary sensing. Um, ultimately, it was paused. The team from Stanford passed it, and then they launched again. And at the end of the day, it actually made it all the way home, which was an incredible, honestly, a testament to what the team had done in, in making it uh, reliable and robust. Long story short, we had, I think, five vehicles finish the challenge that year, which was mm -hmm. an amazing step from the year before. The team from Stanford with some some you know great friends with Sebastian, with Mike Montemurlo, mm -hmm. um, Henrik Dahlkamp, uh, Dirk, um, ended up uh, winning that challenge that year. You know, our teams came second and third, which was, you know, we were obviously disappointed to come second and third, but, you know, incredibly excited about, about the progress and the, you know, it was just really close, right? It was, you know, in, in terms of timing through. So I remember that day. I mean, I think everybody in robotics was following along. I wasn't physically there. I mean, everybody was following along and curious if even any vehicle could finish. And then five were able to complete it. It was so interesting and so exciting to see robotics, which a lot of robotics research stays in the lab. And this is still a lab-like thing to raise in the desert, of course. But it, it felt like, you know, this, this is a bit of a coming of age moment where we're going to see these things maybe transition probably at the time we thought a bit sooner than and thought maybe the problem might be a little easier than it has, has turned out but we might see this transition into you know our own cars in the foreseeable future and i remember then that darpa set up another challenge the urban one where there's actually traffic and you're in you have to negotiate uh, traffic situations i remember you led the winning team on that one and so i'm really curious your experience on, on that challenge how how did it feel fundamentally different from the previous one? How did it launch what you're what you're doing now? Yeah, it, it really was. You know, this incredible series of, and, and energy that, again, I, I can't give enough credit to DARPA for catalyzing what's happened. Through through each of them, the experience became increasingly more professional, right? The first one felt a little, you know, the most like Woodstock, right? And kind of just, there was all kinds of different vehicles there. You know, those of us who picked the Humvee, but some people make specialized vehicles for it. I remember, uh -huh. you know, the ideas like somebody had a leaf blower on the front of their thing because I didn't think this was a great idea. Idea, but it was an interesting idea because if they could blow it with a leaf blower then they'd know it was vegetation kind of thing and you know it's just all kind of stuff whereas the second one became incrementally more professional and then by the the urban challenge everybody was using you know commercial vehicles people were commercially available vehicles people were partnering with auto manufacturers and there was that element of it it was a really interesting challenge because in the first two it was really can you stay on a effectively stay on a trail um, in the third challenge, we had to stay on our side of the road. We had to deal with the other dynamic actors with, you know, they had stunt drivers come and drive vehicles around. We had to deal with dynamic road closures, potentially. Um, we had to, uh, at one point, deal with a part that, where there wasn't going to be a real map for, for where the vehicle had to drive. We had to discover the road itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was really, really exciting. I think it was, it's was it been neat to see the impact of these different programs on where we are today. So with the Grand Challenge, that was the first time we were really using HD mapping technology as part of the, the prior that we provided to the robot. And that's obviously persisted through the approaches we take today. In the second challenge, we started to see some of the early applications of machine learning to these to these systems, and, and that's carried forward. With uh, the Urban Challenge, more and more machine learning in the vehicles, 3D LiDAR, so instead of a single plane of LiDAR, the Velodyne LiDAR was, was part of that approach. Better cameras came online. Automotive radar started to become part of the toolkit we use. And of course, throughout all of this, the available computation on vehicles is ramped up. And then the, the motivation evolved. So early on, it was how do we keep young men and women out of harm's way? You know, how do we enable the supply chains in the military to move safely to the, by the point where we got to the urban challenge, it was clear that there was a huge positive impact that we could have on transportation or road safety. And just you know, reinventing um, how people get around. That is what sprung uh, into the the Google self-driving car program now Waymo, and, and I think fed what what's become the modern self-driving car uh, industry we see today. You led the Google self-driving car effort for many many years. In your words, it was the only game in town back then for self-driving. But then at some point, you left. You started your own. I got to ask you, like, I mean, you were at the leading effort. You established the leading effort, and then you just 
decided to start your own. So you must have had a kind of different vision from the Google slash Waymo vision of how this must come together and hence want to start your own. I'm really curious, how is your vision different and, and how does that you know map to today? So first, like I gave credit to DARPA for their vision and kicking this off, I can't give enough credit to, to Sergey and Larry for the vision of investing in this space, right? Back when people thought we were crazy, literally, uh, mm -hmm. that this could ever happen. The opportunity I had at Google to work with amazing people, to push this industry forward, this technology forward, you know, the privilege of leading that team was, you know, some of the best years of my life. Ultimately, I got to a place where, you know, I just wasn't having, a, you know, enough fun, uh, right? And that I disagreed with some of the things that we were doing. You know, it meant that I wasn't working at my best. The company deserved better. The people that were, you know, I had 650 people were so reporting to me at the time, they deserve better. Larry and Sergey deserve better, right? And so it was time for me to, to kind of uh, move out of the way and create space. And, you know, we've seen, you know, what that team has done in the interim. And so I left and I didn't leave to start Aurora. I left because it was, it was time to move on. I spent a few months trying to figure out what to go do next and ultimately came to the conclusion there was a really exciting opportunity to bring together some great people with different experiences to try and solve this problem with kind of the, the next generation of thinking in the space and it was one where we wanted to put partnership first that if you think about the scale of transportation it's gigantic and that if you had one company that tried to do it all it was hard to believe that we were going to get there quicker than working in partnership uh, with aligned interests with, with others and that seemed like an important founding principle for us that having been a long way down the road in these different uh, you know from different places we kind of had a sense of where did it feel like we were hitting dead ends and if we could go back and do it again where could we invest to avoid that so we could actually get to something that would have commercial scale and, and thus the social and economic impacts that we're hoping for and and so that's what we, were, we set out to do with Aurora we, we built a company with a mission to deliver the benefits of self-driving technology safely quickly and broadly and it's been an incredible four and a half year journey so far yeah very impressive I mean ultimately I, mean, I want to get back to this later culminating and you're announced to go public in the near future so it's it's quite a journey four and a half years to about to go public but going back to some of the things you just said about working with partners, um, I'm really curious, are you able to share some of the partner 